And those were the first words that welcomed us into Kendrick Lamar's sixth studio album, Damn. Now, this is actually one of my personal favorite albums of all time. So thank you guys, you know, for participating in the poll that we ran for which album to dissect next. As always, leave a like, comment, subscribe. But most importantly, let us know if we missed anything. If you guys have any theories, interpretations of any of the songs that we talk about. Just because this is one of the most lyrically dense projects I think I've ever heard. So, you know, there's bound to be something we missed, something that you wanted to let us know. So, uh, you know, we'll see you guys in the comments and uh, enjoy the video. We want to go ahead and start off with blood. Yes. Okay. So I remember where I was when I first heard this track. <laughs> I was uh, mm. driving mm -hmm. back home somewhere. It was late at night. And I was like, oh shit, the Kendrick album finally dropped, I just realized. And I started playing and you know, obviously it starts out where he's telling that story about like walking that blind lady across the street or something. With every line he tells, you're just like, wait, what? Wait, yeah, what? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, it was, she was like, yeah, I have, you have lost something. Your life shoots kendrick oh. that's actually scared like the <laughs> shit out of me in the car i was like oh fuck tell me because i was like it. turning it up like you said i was like oh he's about to go in you know yeah. i, I want to hear what he says uh -huh. and it freaking pops a cap out i'm like oh shit anyway this track really is kendrick starting to highlight the themes of the entire album you know songs like humble you know they show like right. you said a ruthless braggadocious kendrick while tracks like feel pride you know they show his weaker side um but the uh the themes also kind of interplay mm -hmm. across each track you know for example lust as the wicked counterpart of love more of that duality and so it's kind of this demonstrates right. the weakness caused by you know temptation the importance here is that there there is a lot of duality that is set up in this is it wickedness is it weakness you decide basically as we're talking about the importance of duality you know duality of man which can be described as the person we are right now versus the person we wish we were and the duality of this album is presented mm -hmm. within the very first lines of this track and is continued to be echoed throughout the album this begs the question you know who is the blind woman he's helping cross the street you know there's several several theories surrounding the identity of the blind woman on the track fear kendrick's cousin carl when he his like little voicemail about like the book of Deuteronomy or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it talked about how the Hebrews are warmed about the consequences that lead them to damnation, quote unquote, and that the choice of obeying mm -hmm. God, either you choose to obey God or you don't. And that's kind of the woman represents mm -hmm. the consequences of not obeying God. That's one conspiracy. But uh, the one I think mm -hmm. I, I identify more with is she represents Lady Justice or Lady Liberty and that she represents the entire yeah that's right yeah, the entire too. justice system which is inherently unjust since she kills kendrick in that song and you know the gunshot that hits kendrick can be like about how he lost in that scenario he chose the wrong path basically in the beats one interview kendrick kind of refused to speak on mm -hmm. what exactly it means um the deeper meaning mm -hmm. uh he said he wanted you to kind of yeah. let it speak for itself you know as most artists when, should exactly but when zane lowe asked is it the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning he refused to tell him but he says that he's it's, yeah. it's the right question to ask <laughs> that's the whole thing come on i had to ask them uh, yeah i know <laughs> that's the whole thing so i think that kind of says something this also kind of brings up this next aspect that's also really huge and that is the sample i guess this sample it's the news uh clip at the end of the track <laughs> oh i don't like it this is why i say that hip-hop has done more damage to young african americans than racism in recent years Geraldo rivera uh, right he was basically responding to kendrick's uh song all right where you know he says in the track itself you know that line in the song quote and we hate the popo Want to kill us in the street? Faux show. And Kendrick responded to this criticism on TMZ saying, you know, how can you take a song that's about hope and turn it into hatred? You know, the overall message is we're right. going to be all right. You know, it's not a message about like, yeah. I want to kill people, which is what Fox is trying to say. It was clear they got under his skin because he just keeps talking about it. And, you know, he was not happy about that clip. And I wouldn't be happy about that. You know, taking a song that people say is like the anthem yeah. of the decade and saying how it's bad. People were literally yeah. chanting, uh, we're going to be all right during some of the protest chants. Yeah, but... The big takeaway, I think, um, that the listener should 
digest from this first track is that right now Kendrick is giving us the option to choose and it's either do you choose wickedness or do you choose weakness. The song gives off a very uh, Kill Bill, Django Unchained vibe. I think this sets up as kind of like the main menu of, of like a video game or something. You know, it's not necessarily a full song or like a full level of a game, but it sets up kind of this tone, the world, the decisions you're gonna have to make. And also that added shock factor of like, of that gunshot going off. It gives you yeah. that, that moment that you remember when you listen to this album. Oh shit! Whew. I'm already starting to get some chills, like just talking about it, so. <laughs> the next track, we have DNA. This track, he's basically defining the many facets of himself. You know, the good, the bad, the ugly, like, you know, he brags, he contradicts, he reveals himself many times throughout this track. And as it kind of lays a foundation as to why the theme of duality is so important. Uh, but before we get into the track, I want to talk about the music yeah. video, mm -hmm. which has Kendrick Lamar and Don Cheadle appear uh, in the beginning, kind of. Uh, the inferior war machine. Right. <laughs> Damn. They're basically shown in the beginning uh, arguing, but while using the lyrics of the song. And in that same uh -huh. scene, Kendrick Lamar is dressed as, in like the traditional, you know, Kung Fu Kenny uniform. And yeah, yeah. in uh, an interview with Don Cheadle confirmed that he is actually the inspiration for the look of the character Kung Fu Kenny, which is based off his character in Rush Hour 2, Kung Fu Kenny. Anyway, going into the track itself. In the lines, cocaine quarter piece got war and peace inside my DNA. This is basically Kendrick addressing his family history of, you know, they would sling dope and cocaine all the time. Kendrick in that same bar, you know, war and peace inside my DNA, meaning Kendrick has seen both war and peace throughout his life. He's voiced uh, mm. his, you know, disapproval of gang violence and gang activity and he hopes to bring you know peace and unity to the streets of compton and his neighborhood you know he's detailed a lot of the themes on his second album good kid mad city which is one of my favorite rap albums you know of all time you know this yeah. is represented both in the title and how you know as he says in mad city if i told you i killed that nigga had 16 would you believe me or see me to be innocent kendrick you seen in the street with so it's so easy for him to put one foot in one foot out of gang life and and regular life because of how prevalent it is in his neighborhood. He keeps going and he says, What was interesting is though, an interview with Rick Rubin, and he talks about why he includes, you know, this common theme of good and evil in his music all the time. It's like a common theme, especially in this album too. And he says that I was raised in an environment where my father was a complete like realist from the streets and my mom was a dreamer that was implanted in me first that's just dna of who i am uh it's always the yin and the yang the good versus the evil this mm. has been a, an aspect of his life since childhood it's his dad who's always been in you know doing stuff he shouldn't be doing and it's his mom who has been encouraging him to pursue his dreams of music and follow a more respectable path. You know, he continues. Um, this is like the coolest part of the track where he starts just naming stuff off. He's like, I don't know, murder, conviction, burners, boosters, burners, oh, yeah. ballers, dead, redemption, murder. scholars, fathers, mm -hmm. dead with kids. And I wish I was fed forgiveness. Yeah, 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 <sighs> soldier's DNA. That's cool, motherfucking boy! What I think um, kind of stood out to me the most, obviously he's just saying about how much shit he's seen. But the la very last line of that kind of right. progression there, where he says, Born inside the beast, my expertise checked out in second grade. He kind of lost his innocence at a very, very young age. You know, he had seen so much shit growing mm. up that he knows, you know, everything there is to know about the projects in the streets, and he's only in second grade. You know, his expertise checked out at second grade. Mm. He'd seen all he's needed to see. What's important about these two first tracks, Blood and DNA, is that both of them act as kind of the thematic framework in which the entire story and lessons of Dam will be about further down the road. Uh, it's the first song, the first real song on the album, and damn, is it a damn? I'm gonna keep saying damn and pointing it out, but <laughs> damn, it's a statement to like not only, 
you know, us the listener, like, okay, he's back. But also to like all the other rappers, like, I don't know if you're gonna transition into this, but the uh, whole second part of the song where it just goes ridiculous, crazy. That yeah, yeah, yeah. verse right there is one of those verses where you just step back you, while he's going, and you're just like, damn, like. Yeah, yeah. I think this is one of his most aggressive flows that he's done in a while. I think this and maybe Black of the Berry are like his top two most aggressive right. songs in general. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Transitioning, transitioning. Track three. <laughs> yeah, uh, as you said. But um, before by the way, hold on. Uh, oh, I yeah, want to yeah. start. I want to start a new thing for me to edit. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and do a thing that I'm gonna keep count of. Uh, reverse alert anytime they uh, <laughs> foreshadow the whole concept of you know putting it in reverse we're going to start that off we're going to go ding one mm-hmm. um, so yeah leave that go ahead and edit that for me Chesco <laughs> and uh, yeah go ahead sorry I like how you say that before literally I just talk about like exactly that <laughs> oh was that really what <laughs> yeah, you were going to say literally <laughs> that's funny yeah um, anyway <laughs> the production choices reflect a major theme but the sample of this track is uh, Billy Paul's 1979 track, How Good Is Your Game? And the way that it was produced is that the original sample was played in reverse, pitched down, and chopped up to create this distorted tone and a loop that was then had regular drum pattern, drum beat put over it uh, that created the instrumental, as yeah. we know, as, as Yeah. Um, and, you know, reversals, as you said, are a huge aspect uh, of this album in that they reveal a lot of hidden messages and secrets that Kendrick has woven into the majority of this project. So keep this in mind. As we start off with the lyrics. Ding. That's one. Uh, <laughs> One point. Yeah. He uh, goes on in the lyrics saying, Fox knows when I use my name for percentage. Somebody tell Gerardo this nigga got some ambition. Kendrick emphasizes his frustration, obviously, with Fox News and directly calls out um, Geraldo Rivera. He even purposely mispronounces uh, mm-hmm. Geraldo's name. It's, it's supposed to be pronounced Geraldo, but he says Geraldo just to disrespect him even more. Yeah. Uh, Love it. <laughs> he feels Fox will only, you know, manipulate his message and stuff just to earn money and views and television ratings. And Fox has done mm-hmm. this to countless other rappers, you know, Jay-Z, Ludacris, Lupe Fiasco. They've all twisted their lyrics to say how bad and how yeah. evil rap music is. In the next few bars, he says, My cousin Carl Duckworth said, know my words. And Deuteronomy say that we all been cursed. So as I mentioned before, his call this with his cousin Carl Duckworth is, I guess, a really important message, isn't that? On the track Fear, uh, during his voicemail section, he goes into the book of Deuteronomy, um, which he's reciting. And the Deuteron- book of Deuteronomy pretty much says, like, the Lord will send you on, will send you curses and confusion and frustration and that you must deal with until you are destroyed uh, because you have forsaken me. Here, Kendrick basically is saying that a lot of the hardships him and his community are facing is because of, you know, God's wrath and his willingness to test them. He keeps going into this religious theme in that, you know, he says, But it's money to get, bitches to hit, yeah, zeros to flip, temptation is. He's described that there's desires, temptations around his life all the time, as if it's drugs, money, sex, gang violence, or is it to, you know, live a normal life and focus on music and stuff like that. He supplies kind of like a broader reason for why the whole community of the Israelites, which are referenced in Deuteronomy, um, are quote unquote Mm. cursed. But why is it that colored people struggle the most? Um, Is it because God has chosen them to be the ones who he tests the most? Or is it because of the community itself perpetuating and promoting the wrong life choices, you know, gang violence, you know, stuff like that. So again, more duality, more references to how there's a right thing and a wrong thing that Kendrick Lamar must choose. I don't know if you mentioned this, but also like he says, I think towards the end, like talking about his, his connection to his faith and and God. How how do I want to like, you know, when your cell phone signal is not really working well, it's kind of like what it is right now uh, at this point in the album. The next song is actually my second favorite song on this album. Element is the song I'm talking about, by the way. Kendrick is kind of asserting himself as like the most dominant rapper in the game, which I think he has. I don't give a fuck. Right. I don't give 
I don't give a, I don't give a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, starting off, off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of delves into more of the, the interesting aspects of it in that it's his personal, you know, journey um, and how the struggles of his family and himself have endured, how it influenced him to be the kind of guy he was, he is today. He starts off, he says, I'm willing yeah. to die for this shit. I done cried for this shit. Um, make, make, might take a life for this shit. So what he's, um, for the, <laughs> what he's, I'm just like wrapping it to myself. Don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> what he's referring to here is uh, when he says, I done cried for this shit. There was this, I'm not sure what the event was, but there were just a bunch of OG West Coast hip hop, big names. It was like Snoop Dogg, Corrupt, Game, Dr. Drake, Dr. Dre. They were all up there and they kind of called up Kendrick and Snoop Dogg said like, yo, Kendrick, like you are the future. Like you are the next generation. We are passing the tour. He says in the video. I'm going to say this and I'm going to think this. You got the torch, nigga. You better run. You better run with it, nigga, because it's yours. Having those same heroes like say something like that to your face, he just like started to cry from just like pure yeah. joy in the arms of like Snoop Dogg. One of my favorite or most interesting lines on this track, uh, he says, I've been stumped out in front of my mama. Back in 2017 with Big Boy on his radio show saying that he literally was beat up by three guys, three or four guys at some swap meet in LA when he was 15 at the time. And they all ran when they saw his mom was coming out and saw the whole thing go down. Uh, and you know, he's also, he's, he's, I don't know what you say in the car ride right home. <laughs> Basically he fast forwards into years later, he's almost 30. Yeah. He's got $30 million, but he's still not free from violence or from people trying to get at him for who he is. Anyway, he goes into kind of the hypocrisy or calling out what it's like going back home now that he's a, a huge, probably the biggest rapper in the game. He said, uh, mm -hmm. Basically, he's saying people expected Kendrick not to be present in Compton anymore and like forget about his past and once he's become rich, but he isn't. He's like actively trying to like improve his city and he's always there. He's donated, you know, millions to the schools and trying to get kids off the streets and stuff. Mm -hmm. So kind of in summary on, on Element, he asserts himself again as the most dominant rapper in the game. One, one thing I love about this song is that it, uh, it almost like sexualizes violence, you know, just the chorus, you know, if I got to slap a pussy ass N word, I'm gonna make it look sexy. If I got to go hard on a bitch I'm gonna make it look sexy mm. it's almost like he, he finds pleasure in violence the way that that normal people <laughs> uh, value or get pleasure from sex mm -hmm. kind of similar to gonna make our 100th reference to uncut gems but you know kind of how <laughs> betting gives him the these pleasures holy shit I'm gonna come He's kind of glorifying violence, and not not and not to say that in like a bad way, where it's like you know he's making it sound like it's nothing. But for the character at this point in time, it's kind of like what he needed to kind of illustrate to us. He's kind of rugged, and he, yeah. he doesn't really have his stuff in order. So it actually goes right into my favorite song off this album, uh, "Feel." Oh, I yeah. just love how much when you read the lyrics, it reads like poetry. The amount of references, mm. the, the litany in it, where he every line starts with "I feel." And that makes sense. This is probably the most vulnerable Kendrick is on the whole album. You know, he's talking about oh, yeah. a wide range of feelings, you know, particularly the negative ones um, that his rise to, you know, celebrity has kind of elicited in him. The song is, in, is almost like an anxiety attack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like a panic attack. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, a, this seems like an inner monologue that is constantly in his mind telling him these things, even though no matter how big he is, he still feels this stuff, you know? So in the majority of the song, you know, it's like he feels like nobody is looking out for him, um, yet he's cites a really strong desire to still isolate himself from his friends and family he says fuck the world the world is ended i'm done pretending and fuck you if you get offended it's crazy because it's again he's referencing how this fox news reporter <laughs> like has has really <laughs> shouldn't have Geraldo. i don't know what to say to you except you know. keep his name out your mouth for real, we're all there. You gotta watch your shit, man. Like say his name, and I promise you'll see Candyman. Yeah, Kendrick was down bad after that freaking news report. Like, <laughs> the reason why it's one of my favorite, it's my favorite song off this album, is because he uses his voice so perfectly, and it he kind of holds your hand through this song and explains to you like why he's feeling the way that he is at this point in the song. So. Sorry, I don't know why my dogs just went off there, but like you said at the beginning, he's very apprehensive, he's timid, 
he he's sharing his opinion but he's not exactly ranting yet and he it reflects in his voice and then as the song goes there's this anger and rage that kind of feels like it's boiling under the surface until it finally crescendos and explodes in that I have the line here when he goes uh fuck your feelings I mean this for imposters I can feel it the phoenix sure to watch us he explodes yeah. in this fit of rage and then towards the end when he goes ain't nobody praying for me he sounds almost defeated like ain't nobody praying for me ain't nobody praying he, you know it's been it's this this whole song has been cathartic for him but at the end of the day he can't really do anything which i i feel like is how a lot of people feel right now is that you know mm. in this country called america there's there's so many issues and you know we we have so many possible solutions but there's a lot of things in the way of actually putting them in motion uh, so I think that feeling of hopelessness, I think, is very relatable to, I think, a lot of people. And I'm glad he follows this song with a little bit more of an upbeat song. And this next track, Loyalty, basically is mm. about... Loyalty. Yeah, loyalty. You know, the, necess- the necessity of complete loyalty and honesty in both platonic and, and romantic relationship. By the way, hold on. Uh, reverse alert number two, the Bruno Mars sample, uh, 24K Magic, yeah. uh, is played in reverse. I have a statement from the producer Terrence Martin Mm -hmm. he says on loyalty it came about because you know I was working he was working with Rhapsody and Ninth Wonder and it was a Bruno Mars sample of 24 Karat Magic as you said he said I want to replay it reverse it change the key add a third harmony do all the things all these things to it but still make it sound just like the sample but with the different edge basically Uh, he said on God Kendrick said I'm gonna get Rihanna on this (laughs) and that day like right when he put the drums in he called Rihanna a couple days later they agreed and she came in Um, so kind of cool I feel like it's a match made in heaven you know I feel like they're really good together they're kind of both really in tune with like their spirituality and stuff like that this track is doesn't go too too deep into the nitty gritty of either of their lives it's more of a love song in that it's kind of a fun banter between both of them uh the only thing i really have like that really stood out to me was he has this line sitting on the fence meaning he's in the middle of these two two different viewpoints you know again he's another analogy used for his decision to choose wickedness or weakness so even in these more fun upbeat radio friendly tracks he still is bringing the same themes and and uh, morals into it um which i think is cool pride one of my one of my favorite moments where he he's able to just like play around with his voice where it's just constantly pitching up and down and it's he's almost like floating through the entire song uh, mm-hmm. with that flow in the i think the first verse in regards yeah. to what he's saying you know it's obviously another you know very introspective track that continues he kind of delves deep into his own pride and his Recognition is one of the the best rappers alive, which causes tension between, you know, his ideals and, and what he does with them. That kind of is what leads the vocal pitch to vary from high and low, like you said. Kind of reflects the contrast between the right and wrong, like his left side of the brain, the right side of the brain kind of thing. Pride is often considered the original and the most yeah. serious of the seven deadly sins. Another contrast between the beat of Pride um, and then the, the beat of Humble, which is actually pretty uh, intentional in that Pride has very soft spoken. He sounds like he's floating around. He's kind of bouncing between these different pitches while Humble is like, very much in your face it's like kind of a more modern take on like the bombastic you know instrumental each instrumental yeah. is contrasting the topic of their respective songs if that makes sense you'd think a song about pride would be really loud and really strong rather it's pretty chill yeah. but then humble is you know super loud super in your face super braggadocious but it's about being humble you know so it's what kendrick is able to do uh and how he's able to express himself there's very few artists i think that are mm-hmm. able to do it like him uh out, out there today yeah uh so yeah crazy uh going off of pride and transitioning into humble uh i have a really great memory with this song uh it was of you and me we were in uh i already know um, where this is going so you know i was staying up in santa barbara or down in santa barbara and uh you know matt came up and visited me 
and you know we went out to to party and all that <laughs> when humble comes on <laughs> nobody pray with me and then matt turns to me and he's like yo i know every single lyric in this song i'm about to go off and sure enough we both just start screaming the lyrics you know like even natural like we should pray and yet when i tell you like the looks around us like we were just going off and everyone was like damn like these things are going crazy <laughs> to this day like you were saying earlier you can't help but bop to this song that piano is just infectious that dun 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 and yeah going into actually like like what it means Kendrick Lamar in that interview with uh, Zane Lowe uh, he says that if To Pimp a Butterfly is about you know everything that's going on in the world Damn is about himself and what he can do to change himself for the better so that way he can make these positive changes outwardly mm-hmm. this song would represent like you know like you're saying ego yeah you know this song is meant to be you can feel it being the initial radio single of the album you know which isn't a bad thing per se but it's it still gets kind of gets a point across it represents kind of the contradiction in kendrick's character at this point in the album because you know the song's called humble he's mm-hmm. telling you be humble sit down and he's flexing about things like meeting Obama, uh, and 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 I, I kind of want to get into the the A flow, you know, where he goes. Hey, this shit way too crazy. Hey, you do not amaze me. Hey, I blew cool from AC. Hey, Obama just paced me. Hey. I remember reading people initially. They said that uh, this was like Kendrick, you know, jumping on a, a trendy flow. You know, at the time it was you know Lil Uzi Vert, XXX Tentacion, Migos. They were all using this this flow. And first of all, you know, he's not that much older than them, you know, but he actually uses this to kind of juxtapose the idea of being humble and being cocky because he knows that flow is used by Lil Vert, who mm. uses that to typically, you know, like all that. It kind of gives the listener this feeling of familiarity of like, oh yeah, like, you know, this is about cars, it's about money, all that. Like, I've heard this before. Like, I know what this is, you know, got it. It kind of puts that point across without even having to tell you. He's kind of, he's kind of in over his head right now. The big Sean diss, uh, hold up little bitch, which he used on Marvin Gaye and Chardonnay. Hold up, hold bitch, up, sit hold down. My last point about the song, there's so many memorable lyrics, you know, and so many memorable parts that you just scream along to where he goes you know my left stroke just went viral that part like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's this is my one of my favorite tracks i don't know if it's number one i think maybe uh xxx is my favorite one love the song we'll always love the song this is like one of those tracks like a timeless track i think it's it, this and like plain jane <laughs> like no matter like if where yeah. i am <laughs> whatever context i will get down to these songs like it does not matter what year it is if it's like that's live on my knob yeah, yeah. <laughs> does not matter <laughs> yeah i mean that's what music is for right to kind of mm. uh it's a time and place when, when we hear it on the throwback hits in like tw- uh, yeah. 20 years we'll be texting each other like yo like, <laughs> crazy but transitioning into lust again uh reverse alert the beat uh, which is but the story I hear it's from one of those websites that sell drum kits, you know Yeah, it's it's a beat played backwards if you listen to it. Uh, that's why that there's that sound effect where it goes f- f- Yeah from the very first lines, you know I need some water Something came over me it Sets up the rest of the song. It's about people who thirst or lust for things that kind of give him that instant satisfaction. He kind of runs through like his schedule, you know, where he goes like, you know, wake up in the morning, kick my feet up, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it kind of, it speaks to that. The urge to kind of be stagnant, mm-hmm. I think is a lot more tempting than the urge to improve and be better and do things, go to your job. Having lust and love come after each other kind of already begs the question, you know, like which one, uh, is he feeling is it lust which is you know sinful is it love which is genuine you know but it's it's kind of the lifestyle of like being a rap star i guess you know his life has become more monotonous really it's just weird you know once you become successful you don't have to work you know it's just like compared to probably he was busting his ass yeah. as a kid trying to make money um just like his parents did and now that he has multi-million dollars he's living in a mansion probably he just can wake up whenever he wants uh one thing i love about this song actually is the way the way it contrasts from the next song love is this instrumental the instrumental for less it's pretty minimal minimalistic 
it's very gritty, mm-hmm. you know, it's pretty raw. Mm-hmm. And transitioning that into love, it's a, this very euphoric, you know, daydream feeling that really epitomizes, you know, what the title of the song is, Love. It's it, it's the most different song on this album just because, you know, that's what love is to most people in their lives. Like, love is a whole nother category in your brain almost where completely different. Mm-hmm. And that's why the, the song Love really kind of epitomizes that. This is most people's first introduction to Zakari. What an introduction to like your big breakout single is on <laughs> Kendrick Lamar's yeah. like big album right after To Pimp a Butterfly. You know, there's not much lyrically to the song, but it does, uh, similar to Loyalty, it reaffirms that theme of, you know, mm. making a decision, love, lust, and kind of gives you the argument for each side. Love is just a really great song. I was really surprised when I first heard this song. I don't know about you, just because, you know, coming off of albums like Good Kid, Mad City, To Pimp a Butterfly, mm-hmm. you wouldn't expect mm-hmm. this very lovey-dovey type song from, from Kendrick. Kendrick kind of goes into this sidetrack interest in that he begins, or majority of this, this record is about how um, there's a choice he had to make as a kid. There's always two halves to every story in terms of what he has to choose as he's growing up. But then there's also like this take on love and relationships that he kind of weaves into it. He uses this as like a ballad to ask like these essential questions like would you still love me if I did this would you still love me like how loyal are you which is interesting to me really just the biopic of Kendrick Lamar is this is what damn is really and it's just so interesting how it all fits cohesively it's not as deep and and nuanced I think yeah I think in general um when we say that these song the some of these songs aren't as lyrically deep that's not to say that they're uh the lyrics are bad per se um I don't know why I'm saying per se a lot like I don't know that's the word of the day apparently but uh what we mean by depth is that it doesn't uh progress the narrative but it does have great imagery you know it paints Mm -hmm. a picture Uh, you know we're not at at all like trashing some of the songs that we've been saying that aren't lyrically deep like loyalty and love so uh going into the next song xxx where do i even start (laughs) man 